Now, unless there's a really big shock tomorrow, Liz Truss looks set to win the Conservative leadership race and become the next Prime Minister. One of the most important relationships for whoever the new Prime Minister uh, will be is going to be with the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, someone Liz Truss has described as an attention seeker who should be ignored. Well, we can talk now to Nicola Sturgeon to get her take on the leadership race, but also, of course, on the cost of living crisis that is hitting people uh, across uh, the United Kingdom. Thank you so much. It's great to have you uh, on the first show back after the summer recess. Now, it's almost certain that Liz Truss is going to be announced tomorrow uh, as the next Prime Minister uh, of the UK. Do you think she'll be an improvement on Boris Johnson? <laughs> uh, the hard question to start with. Look, time will tell. It's obviously the case that Liz Truss and I don't agree on very much politically, but I'm a firm believer in giving anybody who's coming into the office of Prime Minister uh, a chance to prove themselves. And I will certainly do my best to build a constructive working relationship with her. Remember, she will be, if it is indeed Liz Trust tomorrow, she will be the, the fourth Prime Minister that I've had to deal with in my time as First Minister. And despite my differences with David Cameron, Theresa May, uh, perhaps less so with Boris Johnson, but it wasn't for the want of trying, I've managed to have uh, decent working relationships. And I'll certainly try to do that with Liz Truss as well. Um, I think everybody will want to see uh, what she is going to do. She faces, as all of us do right now, immense challenges. I hope the very first thing she does in office is cancel the looming increase in energy prices, the increase in the energy price cap, and deliver some very substantial help to individuals and businesses. The one thing I would say is that if she governs as she has campaigned over the summer, she will be a disaster, uh, not just for Scotland, but for all of the UK. But let's hope that's not the case, because this is a very serious time for the UK and it needs very serious and very purposeful leadership. You say if she governs as she camp has campaigned, she will be a disaster. Why do you think that? Well, because she has campaigned on the very, how can I say this politely, niche priorities of... 100,000 members of the Conservative Party, you know, focusing on things like tax cuts that would benefit the very richest when it is ordinary people across the country who desperately need help uh, to feed their children and heat their homes. You know, there's been a focus on what the Conservatives would describe as, as woke politics, you know, rhetoric that looks as if it is rowing back on the moral uh, obligation we all have to tackle the climate emergency, which, as it happens, is also uh, the right thing to do over the long term to lower energy prices and improve energy security. So the obsessions of a tiny, tiny uh, number of Conservatives Conservative Party members uh, are not the right priorities for the country. So I think it won't take very long to see whether she is going to govern as a Prime Minister with a focus on the real priorities of the country or not. I think that will become very obvious and evident perhaps within the first 24 or 48 hours of her Premiership. So let's hope uh, she chooses the responsible course uh, and stops pandering to uh, the margins and the Conservative Party. It does, as you say, uh, feel like we're going to find out the direction of travel pretty soon. She's uh, written uh, in the Sunday Telegraph today uh, saying she's going to have uh, immediate action uh, on energy bills, but also, of course, talking an awful lot about uh, tax cuts. Are you concerned that if she does push ahead uh, with tax cuts, as we believe uh, is likely, uh, to say the least, um, what impact that could have on the spending envelope for Scotland and whatever happens, do you think you're going to have to do an emergency budget uh, in response to the new Prime Minister? Uh, well, we're undertaking an emergency budget review right now and we are committed to setting out the outcome of that effectively in an emergency budget uh, within a couple of weeks of whatever budget or fiscal event uh, the new Prime Minister has. Now, we don't know for sure uh, when that will happen or what form that will take, but our working assumption is there will be something of that nature by the end of September. I certainly think that is necessary. And to your question, yes, I am profoundly concerned uh, about the potential impacts of that on the Scottish Government's budget, and I know my counterparts in Wales and Northern Ireland will have the same concerns. I mean, right now we are uh, working within budgets that are effectively fixed and finite. They are not rising 
in line with inflation, but the inflationary pressures are bearing down on our budget as they are on the household budgets of families across the country. Any move, and this is a real risk, that would cut our budgets within this financial year would obviously be of profound concern because it would have big implications for the National Health Service, for local authority budgets, for every aspect of our spending. You know, one of the things we've been trying to do within that finite budget is help those who most need it. We have established a, a Scottish child payment support that doesn't exist anywhere else in the UK, currently giving £20 per week per child to the lowest income families. We have plans to increase that to £25 a week. Real tangible help at this time of crisis. And we don't want anything uh, that reduces our ability to do other things to help. But my other concern about tax cuts is that they target those who are already at the, the best off. You know, many people who are really struggling right now already don't pay income tax and wouldn't benefit from a cut there and, and wouldn't benefit in the same way that richer people would from a cut in national insurance, for example. So this is a time to focus on what is really needed. Can't freeze energy prices first and foremost, come to a, an arrangement then between government and the energy companies about how that is paid back over a longer period of time, effectively spread and share the burden of the soaring gas prices, uh, help businesses because businesses uh, don't even have the limited protection of a, an energy price cap, get more cash into the, the pockets of those who need it most and free up more spending ability for the devolved government so we can do more to protect public services and public sector workers right now. So there's a package that a new Prime Minister could bring to bear and it would deliver real help and relief to millions across the UK. I guess just to put the counter argument on uh, tax cuts is that Liz Truss and those around her would argue that cutting taxes helps boost, boost growth, which would then uh, help uh, the economy uh, through uh, that sense. You mentioned as well uh, energy bills uh, and action on energy bills. Uh, Liz Truss has said she would take immediate action on that. There are reports that that could include more drilling licences uh, in the North Sea. W would you be happy to see more oil and gas taken from the North Sea to try and increase the energy supply? But we, we've got to uh, make a careful and just transition away from oil and gas. Uh, that's a, an imperative for the, the planet right now. But actually, it is the, the way that we work towards greater ener energy security and lower energy uh, bills. We are undertaking right now in the Scottish Government our own uh, energy review, looking at the requirements over the longer term. Uh, but you know what is more important, I think, uh, than continuing to explore for more oil and gas is that we fully support uh, the renewable energy transition. So we've just had uh, an auction round uh, in the North Sea, which has given the initial go ahead to up to 28 gigawatts of offshore wind energy. That's the future. Uh, that also gives us enormous potential in green hydrogen uh, to help uh, fulfil our own energy needs, but also can be a big export potential. So that's what I said earlier on. Uh, we need to support oil and gas as it transitions, and there's lots of workers in Scotland dependent on that industry right now. So I'm not complacent about that, but it is the wrong priority uh, if you take your eye off the renewables uh, revolution and the renewables transition. And that's what worries me, uh, as well as irresponsible talk about fracking, for example. Let's focus on uh, making sure that we harness our renewables potential, uh, which fulfills all of these important objectives in the longer term. Uh, now, I just want to talk a bit about, uh, about uh, independence. Uh, you have said that you want to hold another Scottish independence referendum in October 2023. Liz Truss, of course, uh, during the uh, Hastings campaign has said, if I'm elected Prime Minister, I will not allow another independence referendum. So she's been talking pretty tough uh, on it. If Liz Truss becomes Prime Minister, do you think that does impact the chances of you holding another referendum? Well, look, whether Scotland has a referendum, whether Scotland uh, does or does not uh, vote to be independent, it really shouldn't be up to any UK Prime Minister. Actually, it shouldn't be up to a First Minister either. This is about a fundamental principle of democracy. Now, there is going to be a, a Supreme Court hearing in October next month that will look at uh, whether or not the Scottish Parliament has uh, the legal ability to legislate for a referendum, regardless of what a, a UK Prime Minister says. I hope the outcome of that will be positive, but of course that is a, a matter for the court. You know, what cannot be escaped here, you know, whatever Liz Truss or any Prime Minister says, 
is the democratic aspirations of the, the people of Scotland. You say I want to have a referendum next year. I do. Uh, but that's uh, the basis on which I was elected First Minister last year. There is a democratic mandate. And my message to Liz Truss is not uh, to, to say that I, I think I can persuade her to support independence. She is opposed to independence. She's entitled to uh, have that view. Uh, but make the case for the continuation of the union. I will make the case for independence and let the Scottish people decide. You know, it is not a sign of strength on the part of Liz Trust to talk about blocking a referendum or, as some reports today suggest, gerrymandering the rules for a referendum. That is a sign of fundamental weakness Let's uh, talk and a about, lack uh, of the... confidence in her case for the union. Let's talk about, you mentioned there about, uh, as you put it, gerrymandering the rules. This is the report from the Sunday Times that the trust team want to introduce a new law that would mean a referendum could only take place, uh, so if a referendum takes place, at least 50% of Scotland's entire electorate would have to uh, vote uh, to leave the union for it to happen. So in other words, not a simple uh, majority uh, as we've seen in the EU referendum or in the previous uh, referendum. Um, for something you know, as significant as breaking away from the union, um, is that something that you would accept? No, because it is a changing of the basic rules of democracy that we have all abided by for you know, our entire lifetimes and long before that. Can you imagine uh, the furore, uh, the literal foaming at the mouth that we would have had from the Conservative Party if MD had suggested that for the Brexit referendum? You cannot, uh, just because you fear losing a democratic contest is not an excuse or doesn't make it acceptable to try to rewrite the rules of democracy. That's my point here. You know, there has never been a positive case for the union made uh, by those uh, who put forward that case. In 2014, they tried um, and got away with it in 2014 to scare people in Scotland. I remember back then there was all sorts let's, of scare stories about all sorts of things, but let's, including uh, that our energy not, bills would go up. Rather than, up rather than getting too uh, involved into now, the rights and wrongs that are of uh, the, the, well, the arguments well, you've which asked me have a been well about, rehearsed, about I'm quite interested to know what about I'm the, how, a, uh, the, how a referendum could actually... Uh, take place because another uh, part of the Sunday Times uh, report uh, is saying that the UK government wouldn't consider allowing another referendum unless there was evidence for more than a year that at least 60% of voters wanted one. If you look at the uh, recent polls, I think we can have a look at the YouGov uh, tracker poll uh, for uh, support for uh, independence, and you can see that it's actually waned recently. Um, do you think that this perhaps suggests that, you know, at a time when people in Scotland are worried about turning their heating on, you know, food banks are saying that people aren't picking up potatoes because they don't have the money to boil them, do you think people are worrying perhaps that independence is a distraction from the cost of living issues? Well, it's not a distraction and part of my job is to uh, persuade people of that because part of the reason we're in this mess right now is because we're not independent and therefore we don't have the levers to try to navigate our way out of that. If Scotland was independent, we could already uh, have passed an emergency budget. We'd have powers to reform the energy market to deal with some of the underlying causes of this. I wouldn't, as First Minister of Scotland, be sitting here right now, as we were discussing earlier on, profoundly concerned in case a, a Prime Minister in London that Scotland hasn't voted for is about to take decisions that cut our budget even more. Uh, we wouldn't have a position where we have to accept that people are reliant on food banks. Some of the action we have taken, the Scottish child payment that I mentioned earlier on, we could build on that because we'd have access to more levers and resources. Actually, independence is much uh, more necessary when we're dealing with crisis because it gives you more levers uh, to navigate your way through and on to a better future. But the point I, I wanted to complete, it wasn't about getting into the substance. You asked me about all of these different stories about attempts on the part of UK governments to gerrymander the rules. Uh, only uh, politicians fearing the democratic outcome uh, would ever contemplate that. Let's have the debate on substance where I and my colleagues will make the case for independence, for Scotland becoming like other okay. independent countries across the world, able to navigate our own future and let people like Liz Truss make okay. a case for the union. But then, democratically, let the people of Scotland decide. That's how okay. democracy works. It's how democracy should always work. Um, you, at the beginning of the interview, you were talking about your relationship with other uh, previous Prime Ministers. And I just want to touch upon your personal relationship with Liz Truss, because obviously personal relationships do matter uh, in politics. And I think I can just play you what Liz Truss said uh, at a hustings uh, in uh, August about you when she was asked. Let's have a listen. I feel like I'm a child of the union. 
that I really believe we are a family and we're better together. And I think the best thing to do with Nicola Sturgeon is ignore her. She's an attention seeker, Seb. That's what she is. She's an attention seeker. That's what she is. Are you really going to be able to work with Liz Truss? I will do my best, and it is up to Liz Truss to decide whether she wants to, to work with me. Let's put the personal insults to one side. Again, coming back to the argument I made about if you're confident in your case, you don't need to try to block democracy or gerrymander democracy. Uh, similarly, I'd say to I mean, Liz Truss, just she's to come in, because in it doesn't come because I do think it's perhaps... You don't, you don't make... Just to come in, because I do feel it is slight a two-way thing with you guys, I have to say. You recently uh, said that the main thing Liz Truss wanted to talk to you about uh, when she met you, uh, I think um, quite recently, uh, was how she could get into Vogue. I'd just been interviewed by Vogue, you said. That was the main thing she wanted to talk to me about. Uh, I remember it because we were there at the world's biggest climate change conference in Glasgow, and that was the main topic of conversation she was interested in pursuing. Just talk me through what happened there. I was asked a question if I'd had a conversation with Liz Truss. It's the only uh, sort of lengthy conversation or meaningful conversation I can recall having with Liz Truss. So I, I answered the question about what we talked about. And um, look, I'm perfectly willing to put, not to put our political differences aside, because uh, in a democracy you, you have political debates. But I will, as I did with David Cameron, Theresa May, uh, to some extent Boris Johnson, although I think most people would uh, recognise that was more difficult, to build a working relationship. I'm not perfect. I'm not saying that uh, I'm blameless when those relationships go through uh, difficulties, but I will try to build that relationship. But the point I was making is that her comment about ignoring me is in a similar vein to trying to block democracy. You don't uh, make a, a problem that you fear you can't solve uh, properly go away by simply ignoring it. You engage so you're not in, an in attention democratic seeker, then. debate. And, I'm a politician. I mean, part of your job as a politician is to get attention for yourself, your policies, your values. Um, I mean, I don't mean this pejoratively, but I've never looked at Liz Trust and uh, think, thought that she was uh, some kind of shrinking violet. Uh, and that's not a criticism. In politics, that's part uh, of the, the job that you, you have to do. But the ignoring point is perhaps more fundamental because, look, People in, some people in Scotland vote for me and my party. Some people don't. Some people like me. Some people loathe me. That's democracy. But I am the democratically elected first minister of my country. And that means quite a lot of people have voted for me. And when they hear Liz Truss saying I should be ignored, you know, what they hear is that Scotland's voting choices should be ignored or that Scotland should be ignored. And I tell you something, I think people in Scotland, you know, are really getting increasingly fed up with Tory Prime Ministers that, remember, we don't vote for and wouldn't vote for if we'd had the chance with Liz Truss trying to ignore and talk down Scotland. And that is one of the many reasons uh, why I think increasing numbers of people in Scotland will support Scotland being an independent country, okay. so that that important relationship with the rest of the UK is on the basis of equality. OK. Now, we are uh, out of time, but there's just one uh, thing I would like to ask you. It's something that uh, I've spoken to you about uh, before. I know it's something that you feel uh, strongly about. Um, this week, my colleagues Liz Bakes and Agnes uh, Chamber have been looking into allegations of sexual misconduct uh, and the culture uh, in Westminster. And really, it, this crosses across all different parties, uh, what they've been looking into. Uh, one former SNP staff member told them the attitude in Westminster is, if it's not rape, it's OK. Of course, there have been allegations about members of your own party. The Commons watchdog found Patrick Grady sexually harassed a junior member of staff. He, of course, has since quit the SNP. Are you happy with the way that your party has dealt with these allegations of sexual misconduct? Um, no, I think we can be better, and I'm not going to shy away from that. I think every party, every organisation dealing... Uh, belatedly, I think, because too often in the past these are things that have been swept under the carpet. I think we've all got lessons to learn. I, I said in the context of the, the Patrick Grady case that we had lessons to learn, and that is the case. So we are looking at our procedures as a party, as parliamentary groups, all of the time. Uh, we've gone through a very painful process as the Scottish Government um, because of issues you and I have spoken about previously. And some of the 
the scrutiny and the pressure I've had over the past few years on these issues, um, in particular the, the highest profile one of these, is because I've not been prepared simply to sweep these things under the carpet. So, no, I don't think we are as good as we need to do, and that's something I take seriously, and I'm intending to ensure uh, that we do get better so that women uh, or men uh, who feel that they have been uh, the victim of sexual harassment or sexual abuse feel confident in coming forward and feel confident in the processes that they then use. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, there, First Minister uh, of Scotland.